I am just delighted to be here and to welcome you to back to the Cancer Center. It's been quite a year, as you know. The Prouty this year was um, just an amazing event that uh, yet again exceeded all of our expectations. And I don't know, Gene, are you going to have more words about yeah, the Prouty later. later on? Uh, but it really uh, has been a spectacular year. The trajectory of the Cancer Center is uh, right on target. Um, we're just finishing the last year of our five-year strategic plan. We've reviewed that, and we have accomplished um, virtually everything. We had identified five major areas, 46 tasks that we had to accomplish in five years to um, meet those goals. I think we've completed something like 43 of them. We're on our way to get them done the rest of the year, and we're producing our next strategic plan. It's a very exciting time. Um, cancer research is just way out in front of what anyone ever expected. The benefits now of uh, what's called recombinant DNA technology, the ability to clone genes and study individual genes is now reaching not only a fruition where those altered genes mark the specific molecular basis of individual cancers, but now we are evolving to the point of having targeted specific therapies to treat the underlying lesions of cancer as opposed to simply some growing cells that shouldn't be growing. Um, so uh, cancer research in all its dimensions is um, just uh, in its uh, real uh, renaissance for those of us who have uh, kind of awaited this day. Um, the Cancer Center uh, has been deeply involved in community affairs and has um, started uh, a number of initiatives really under the leadership of Talisa Stewart, who's here in the audience, um, trying to bring what we are learning about cancer prevention and communicating about cancer prevention to the community. Um, we are reaching, if you can imagine this, tens of thousands of people now um, with messages about cancer prevention, and I'm really excited about that. It's a new area for us, and one that we see as a real opportunity to grow and make very significant impacts going forward. And then, of course, uh, what is really the sort of centerpiece and the best known aspect of any cancer center, and that is um, its patient care. And uh, we are working very, very hard in the context of healthcare reform uh, to uh, bring these major advances in cancer treatment to the public in a manner that is um, safe, uh, efficient, um, wise, and uh, you can imagine that uh, in New Hampshire this is not an easy undertaking where there's a deep commitment to cutting costs almost regardless of what the ramifications of that is or are. And so uh, that brings me to my official duty here tonight, which is to introduce to you Dan Jansen, who's the Chief Operating Officer of the hospital. Next to my family, Dan is the most important guy in my life. <laughs> uh, it may seem like the Cancer Center does a lot of things. I hope it does, but we really don't do anything out of the context of uh, the medical center. And uh, it's really uh, Dan's deep, deep commitment. Uh, and I don't think you'll ever meet a finer COO his deep, deep commitment to the welfare of our patients that, uh, no, it's really true. Uh, there are damn few people in this world that I would feel comfortable working with or for, but um, Dan has a deep commitment to uh, serving our patients um, and serving them well. And it makes my job really uh, infinitely easier than it would be if we were just, uh, and I don't mean this in a pejorative sense, where we're just another business trying to get through to the next day. So um, it's actually with some excitement that I think this is the first time, Dan, that you've had an opportunity to meet the people who um, really enable the vision of the Cancer Center. You guys are just fantastic. I mean, I can't say enough about what philanthropy means to us. Um, I don't get a chance to talk to you that often, but um, Dan has heard me say this before, philanthropy enables vision. And so... I'm really happy to bring the vision, especially when there's an opportunity to uh, operationalize it. And so you guys are a key part of that puzzle, and Dan is the other big piece of that puzzle. And so, Dan, thanks so much for being oh, Mark, here. Thank today. you.
Am I on, Andy? Can you? I, I really want to thank you as well. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. And um, as Mark was talking about the cornerstone of the Cancer Center, I think the, cor the, the, um, the Cancer Center is actually the cornerstone of Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. It's something we're incredibly proud of. Whenever I speak to a group, um, I often run through a list of, um, of things that make us unique and differentiate us. And the fact that Norris Cotton is here, one of only 40 comprehensive cancer centers, NCI designated um, in the country, really makes us proud. And when I look out among all of you, you make me proud because um, we, we can't do what we do without your help. And so if I leave you with any thought tonight, it's just a big thank you for all that you do to help us do what we do. I wanted to just spend a few minutes, whenever I have a captive audience, I like to share um, s some of sort of current events and um, at least pull another uh, maybe 50 people into um, a better understanding of what's going on in the United States. And I want to do that um, by just briefly providing some perspective on the long-term challenges that we face here at Dartmouth-Hitchcock as well as Norris Cotton, but it really is that we face as a nation, which impact everybody in this room. But first, I want to administer a little test. How many people have ever, at some point in their life, have read something about the aging or um, graying of America? Raise your hand. <laughs> you all pass. <clears throat> How many people actually know when that phenomenon actually begins? Probably a lot less, right? So one of my observations over the years is we talk a lot about the aging of America, but I'm not sure that any of us have ever really stepped back to really understand when it starts and what it means for us as a, as a nation. We read about it in the paper. Um, and so I want to share just some brief information. This is a bar chart of the Medicare enrollees as a percentage of the US population. So this is everybody that's age 65 and older. And the Medicare program was originally founded back in 1966. So if you go back about a decade, so the first 34 years of Medicaid, we saw some pretty significant um, growth in the Medicare population as a percentage of the nation. So that's the aging phenomena. That's how you see it occurring. It's growing at a faster rate than the rest of the demographics of the US. But when you look at the last decade, roughly, it's been pretty flat. And, and that's what always takes me back a little bit, because I think about what's happened here. And for those of you that most of you live in the area, I'm assuming, you, you know what's happened here in the last decade. And just to, to look at two um, quick statistics, our discharges in the last decade have grown by 35%. Our OR activity, largely um, generated by surgically related oncology, I mean, that's a big piece of it, up 60%. And yet the aging phenomena has not really taken off. And so the answer to the question of when does it start is actually, it started this year. In 2011, every, every month, Every day, I'm sorry, every day um, beginning in January, 11,000 baby boomers will turn 65, will enter that Medicare population. Um, and so what we read about is actually, we're right on the beginning of the cusp of that. And if you look at the next 10 years and five year increments, you can get a quick sense for what's gonna happen. And if you eliminate a couple of these charts, um, bars, and go back to the, I'm gonna round, take some liberties. I used to be in finance and now I'm in operations, so I round a lot more. Um, I'm going to say that for the last 50 years, rough, rough, roughly, um, from 1966 to 2010, um, the Medicare population grew from 9 to almost 13 percent. In the next 10 years, it's going to grow by roughly the same amount. So what took 50 years to occur is going to happen in the next 10 years, with half of it occurring over the next five years. Why is that an issue? One is that access is going to be a problem. I didn't want to burden you with all kinds of charts, but there's another chart that um, taking a look at that showed the number of physicians versus the supply, supply and demand of physicians going into the next 20 years, that's a problem. And what I do with my kids often, started back in 2008 when we were entering financial Armageddon, I said, um, here's the deal, this is what's happening. Right now we have this many, re this many people in the United States working to support this many retirees. And in the future, that's gonna flip around. We're gonna have this many people working to support this many retirees. And my message then was economic, and it was if you think that your tax rate, your high-end tax rate is going to be 35%, probably not going to happen, right? Because we need to support a much larger population with a much smaller working a workforce. But then apply that to health care. Right now we have this many providers, doctors, nurses, administrators, taking care of patients that are a much smaller population. That's going to flip around. We're going to have a smaller supply of, of 
providers taking care of a larger supply of patients, not to scare everybody. But that's a demographic that we're facing. And so access is going to be a challenge. And then in 2014, with health care reform, we're going to have 30 million more people with um, access to some form of insurance through an broke- um, exchange or through Medicaid. If you compound that with, um, if you think about, you know, where, if I just said, where do we spend the health care dollar, everybody would say, well, later in life, right? And that's what this chart says. For the Medicare population, age 65 and over, we spend roughly $15,000 per person in the country. For the working age group, 18 to 64, it's a, uh, about a third of that, 4,500. And for pediatrics, it's about a fifth. And so we spend most of our health care dollar later in life. And in fact, most of the health care dollars spent in the last six months of life. We've done a lot on that here on this campus with palliative care, and we're really proud of that work. But when you put it together, when you think about the demographics and where we spend the health care dollar, this is the problem with health care, and this is why you read about it every day in the paper, which is this, this chart, a little bit dated, is the total U.S. Um, health care expenditure chart. Um, includes physicians, hospitals, long-term care, et cetera. And in 2007, and we're still a little bit north of this now, um, but it's still in the $2, million, $2 trillion range, that will, in the next just 10 years, that will double to $4 trillion and then continue to grow through 2050. So if you think about the rate of growth uh, and think about the demographic slides I showed you and think about what we're, what we're headed into, that's why healthcare is such an imperative. And we're on a pathway as a nation that's simply unsustainable. So enter healthcare reform in a grossly oversimplified way. What's healthcare and really insurance form all about? At the highest level, it's about the fact that we're making an investment, 16% of GDP currently, growing to 22% in the not too distant future, that's not really yield, yielding such a hot result, which is the health of our nation. When you look at where we rank, we're probably number 42 or 43 terms of overall health status as a country, and yet our investment in our healthcare system is the highest in the, in the, in the world. And so healthcare oversimplified is nothing more than producing a better return or outcome at a lower cost, and that's what we're all about. We're incredibly focused on creating value here at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, here at Norris Cotton. The work that Mark, Michael, and others are doing on the clinical side is just has been phenomenal, including trips to Corning, which really has set the standard for um, improvement work. And so we're really focused on quality um, and increasing the quality and the outcome of the care that we provide, lowering the cost over time. And that's actually right in line with healthcare reform, and we were headed into that long before healthcare reform. In fact, we looked at healthcare reform as affirming the steps that we were already taking. When you step back and think about, well, how does that relate to cancer? What's going to happen on the oncology front? We're, we're looking, and Mark reminds us of this frequently at a roughly 40% increase in overall oncology volume, both nationally and here in the Upper Valley in in, uh, states of New Hampshire and Vermont. And so we need to be thoughtful and prepare for that. At the same time, we're looking really hard um, at at how we provide care. But more importantly, we're looking at ways to reduce that through through the research that we do as an NCI-designated research facility. And so I want to step back, and some people have criticized us to some extent. Well, if you're going through all these reductions and Medicaid just whacked us for $50 million, which many of you probably read in the paper, why are you building buildings? Well, because we have to prepare for the future, and the lead time on a facility is three to five years. So one of the things that um, this was an architectural rendering of a facility where we're consolidating three very old and aged facilities in Nashua into a new facility and this was the original di- um, drawing from the architect. This picture is from last weekend. And so it's actually becoming a reality. And we're scheduling, it's scheduled to open in January. And this will be a new home for a new site for Norris Cotton, who's not currently in Nashua. And if you think about Nashua, it's the second largest community in the state of New Hampshire and the fastest growing um, community. And you think about the whole demographics of southern New Hampshire. So our reach of Norris Cotton is now will be extending even further down into Nashua in just a couple of months. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't just show you our mission and our vision. Um, A couple years ago, we we put pen to paper and we revised our mission and we documented documented a vision statement for the first time. And it was one of those landmark um, sort of lines of demarcation where it changed who we're becoming. 
And when I think of, there's a little um, vignette about um, somebody from NASA who was pushing a room and somebody walked up and said, what are you doing? And, and the response was, I'm helping to send a man to the moon. And now, after this vision, achieving the healthiest population possible, you walk through the hallways and people are really focused on, well, how does that contribute to population health? So we've stepped out of just being a healthcare provider into thinking about how do we advance the health of a population? And when I step back and think about Norris Cotton and what it's done over the years, it's really been the pioneer, bringing to, together the research, the education, being at the forefront of clinical translational science um, and translating that into the bedside and I would say that's one of the areas where we're probably farthest ahead in terms of achieving this vision. But at the end of the day, it's all about people. We're here to take care of people. And when you think about what you do to help us, you're actually helping other people, which is why I love working here. And I'm a big proponent, as Mark said, of, of what we do here every day. And I want to just introduce you to somebody who's a friend of mine, who some of you know, I know, as I look around the room. Um, but I knew him before he was famous. So he's not only a Chad hero and a Prouty hero now, he was also, um, his family was an extreme makeover family in Lyme, New Hampshire. And um, he's, he's a close personal friend. Our families have known each other for quite a long time. And back in July of 2008, I have permission to share this. July 2008 was a Wednesday morning. I was at work. I remember it vividly. And um, my wife called me and said, hey, Elena Marshall called. And she said that um, Cam woke up yesterday. This is Cam with some bruises on his body, and I didn't think anything of it at the time. Um, but today he woke up and he is like covered with bruises and none of them hurt. And so I'm taking, I'm taking him to DHMC. And so Deb called me at work and I'm thinking, I'm not a clinician, but, but I've been around long enough to know. And so sure enough, by 10 o'clock in the morning, he was diagnosed with leukemia. By noon, he was in our infusion suite. Now, if we weren't here and you weren't helping us to be here, Cam Marshall would not be able to receive the level of care that he needs as a pediatric oncology patient struggling with leukemia without going to Boston. There just isn't any place else. And so I can't impress upon you enough the value of what you do because it impacts people like Cam Marshall. And he's actually at the end of a two and a half, long, um, two and a half year long period. Um, he's doing great and we're all really happy for him. And he, every time I use his picture, I call him and let him know. Because um, he's a big advocate um, for the Cancer Center and for Chad and for DHMC. I saw him talking to the governor at a NASCAR fundraising breakfast when he walked right up to Governor Lynch and started to talk to him about um, you know, pediatrics and funding and Medicaid. And I was thinking, whoa, Cam, go. <laughs> um, so I want to end by saying there's so many good things happening in cancer, and this is a little bit out of my area of expertise. Mark should probably be doing this, but if you think about how far we've come in the last 30, 20, 10 years, while we have an aging population that's growing and the overall absolute value of cancer cases will increase and has increased, the incident or the, the rate of cancer has actually decreased. And if you think about some of the top um, cancers, breast, lung, prostate, colorectal, they're all declining in terms of um, incident or rate per thousand. So we're making a dent. Um, Mark's told me that molecular science has really um, kicked into high gear. If you just think back not that long ago, 15 years ago, there were 30 FDA uh, approved drugs for oncology. Now there's 300 and it's just, it's growing exponentially. We have vaccinations, as you can see, um, for certain cancers, which not long ago we never had. And I would say in our lifetime, cancer has gone from being a death sentence. I was just reading a book, a biography, and it was talking, um, the, the author was talking about losing a, a younger sister. It was in the 50s. She had leukemia, just like Cam Marshall. And in the 50s, if you had leukemia as a child, it was a death sentence. Today, it's not. Today, um, we're much, it's much more of a disease that can be managed. And so the five-year survival rate now overall is 70%, whereas not that long ago, it was 50%. Um, and so with, with the work that we're doing and other comprehensive cancer centers on the research front, the ever-improving care that we're striving to, to deliver, uh, my message to you is that what you do matters not only to us greatly, but more importantly, to the patients that we serve, not only um, current patients or past patients, but future patients. And so. I'll just end by saying I can't thank you enough on behalf of Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center for everything that you do to allow us to do what we do. And so I'll stop there and, um, and just say thank you.
Well, watch out. I'm bringing them on the road with me. So <laughs> uh, I think you get a feel for um, the kind of people who work here and uh, our commitment to doing what we say we're going to do. But um, I think from the very top where Dan sits to sort of the ongoing work that we do on a daily basis in the Cancer Center, we're really fortunate to have a group of people who work at this medical center and in this cancer center who are really deeply committed to things that are important to you, obviously, or you wouldn't be here tonight. So um, I hope you have a good uh, feel about the investment you're making, and uh, we really want to um, do everything we can to thank you and to um, let you know that this is a team effort and you're an important part of that team. Now, um, something that uh, I learned long ago is that um, people uh, who come to these kinds of meetings, and uh, this is true of lots of different kinds of meetings, really enjoy um, getting to, uh, a little bit of a feel for some of the things we do and understanding something new. So when they go home, they can tell their spouses or children or friends um, kind of what's going on up at the cancer center. And uh, there really is uh, just a beehive of activity um, going on. But uh, this evening, uh, Hal Schwartz and Ann Flood, who um, lead a really somewhat different area of investigation that's really important for us, but not something you would normally think of as cancer research, um, uh, have agreed to come and talk a little bit about their work here in the Cancer Center. Hal is actually the uh, program uh, leader of our radiation biology and imaging program, and Anne is also a very active uh, participant. Um, and um, I think what I'll do, they're both have more titles, more honors, more editorial boards than I could simply go through. They're each very senior members of our faculty. But um, Hal, I think uh, without carrying on, I'll let, uh, are you going to start? I'll let you come up and sort of introduce the topic and t tell us a little bit about um, which of the innumerable things that Hal does at a world-class level he's going to talk about. But um, uh, I, I have a pretty good idea of uh, um, what we're going to hear about tonight. So, uh, well, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased and proud to be able to speak to you. Uh, I had thought that it was probably on the basis of our research, and I hope it is in part, but there was a big emphasis on the aging of the population, so I'm sure that's why they chose me. <laughs> but uh, so we're actually going to talk about some direct cancer research and also uh, something, as Mark said, that's a little bit different. Uh, and this is going to be a two-person uh, presentation. I'm going to give some overviews and a little bit, and some very interesting and different things that we're doing uh, in fighting cancer and trying to individualize therapy. Uh, and that part of our program especially is here only because of the Cancer Center, is here only because of the support that we've gotten and are continuing to get to be able to drive forward with something that is unique at Dartmouth and I think will be uh, really, really very important. It's important now, but it'll be more important in the future. So we're going to talk about fighting cancer uh, tooth and nail. Uh, I'm going to talk about oximetry, so what's directly related to cancer care, to individualizing cancer care, to making cancer care better and more effective. Uh, and Anne is going to talk about dosimetry, which is a little bit different, uh, and, uh, but is also very important. And uh, fortunately, uh, we've received some really excellent external support for that. Uh, and we're going to do this uh, talking about a technique called EPR, electron paramagnetic resonance, which is unique at Dartmouth in the sense that we're doing clinical studies here. We're the only place in the world uh, but uh, there, are, there are lots of places that are very interested in taking it, it on. Uh, so uh, we have a center, which we call the EPR Center, and uh, it's, uh, I think, been a, 
uh, at the world's, at the leading edge. Uh, it's a technique that's sort of like MRI, but I won't bore you with the details. Uh, we've been developing it. It's the only place that has a clinical EPR program. We have about 30, actually, that's getting a little old. It's probably about 40 because we've been fortunate in our funding. Uh, we have one of the eight centers uh, in the U.S. for medical countermeasures for radiation. Uh, uh, the funding for this year will be in the, on the level of about $10 million, which is about an order of magnitude more than I've ever had before uh, and is really hard to manage, uh, but uh, really pleased to have it. And the re only reason we have it is because uh, uh, the one talent that I have is to attract outstanding people who do the real work. Uh, our instruments are on the Hanover campus and in radiation oncology here in the Cancer Center uh, down on the second floor in radiation oncology. We have collaborations across the whole spectrum, the wonderful spectrum of uh, DHMC uh, in many departments. Uh, and we have collaborations around the world with companies and universities uh, ranging from little tiny companies to General Electric. So that's sort of the overview. Uh, EPR, what, why are we interested in EPR? Because it can do some things that you can't do. And I have in red the things that we're going to talk about tonight. We can measure oxygen, and I'll explain why that would be very, that's very important in terms of improving cancer therapy. And we can measure free radicals, and Anne's going to talk about uh, why these radiation-induced free radicals are so important, and can do some other things uh, which are less important. And we've taken EPR from a uh, small animal, in a, it's a magnetic resonance technique, so you need a magnet, uh, to a somewhat larger animal, uh, uh, and we've developed this technique then for making measurements in, uh, uh, in real people. Uh, so we have a number of things going on here, at Dartmouth-Hitchcock uh, in clinical, uh, clinical applications that, again, I stress are unique. And one of the reasons we can do it is because of you, because of the support that we've gotten. So we're, uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the measurement of oxygen in tumors, why that can be used to individualize and improve cancer therapy. And that's really the name of the game now. How do you take our general and our specific developments and apply them to real people and make and take care of that particular person best for their particular cancer and their response. Uh, and, uh, and we also are measuring oxygen in healing wounds and in peripheral vascular disease. And, some, uh, and then the other thing that in vivo EPR can do that Anne will talk about is measuring radiation and she'll explain why that's so important. So just, I thought you might be interested in what kind of instruments are here. So this is our clinical instrument. Uh, uh, if anybody's interested, I can show you on the second floor here uh, where we're measuring patients. And we have a whole variety of things, including some transportable ones that Ann will talk about. Uh, why do clinical oximetry? Because in a tumor, the oxygen determines whether or not that tumor responds to, to radiation and to chemotherapy. It is the single most important factor that determines the response to therapy. And if you could measure it accurately, you could optimize that th the therapy. But the oxygen changes with, in a very complex way, so you have to measure it. And uh, we now have this ability, uh, unique ability in the sense with this technique, to repeatedly measure oxygen and to individualize therapy. And that's our goal. And, uh, and that's what I've been working for all of my uh, now uh, fairly considerable uh, uh, experimental life. Uh, so we want, to, so the goal is to improve clinical outcomes. So the bottom line, the reason that you're helping us raise money, the reason that the Cancer Center is important is to improve clinical outcomes, to help people. So what are we doing? So we're measuring. So we've begun, uh, and this is early stage uh, uh, research. Uh, we're starting to make direct measurements of oxygen in tumors. Why, why do we want to do it? Uh, uh, we've gotten 12 uh, in, in collaboration. We've made measurements in 12 different people. 
uh, the only place in the world that's done it. And we see that the oxygen varies and varies over the course of the treatment. And we're particularly interested in how do you take and improve the oxygen so that you can improve the treatment. And it works out that the oxygen in the tumor tends to be very low. The oxygen in the normal tissues is relatively high. If you can increase the oxygen, the tumor responds better, but the normal tissues already have full oxygen, and so they don't get harmed. And that's the name of the game in medicine, in all types of medicine, is the therapeutic ratio. Can you do more harm to the tumor than to the normal tissues? Uh, and this tells, this lets us do it. Just to show you a little bit uh, some of the kinds of data. So we get a measurement that tells you about the oxygen in this particular patient. What we're doing is a very simple technique because we want to do something that can be done in real people in ordinary medical settings. And so we're just having the patient breathe 100% oxygen. Instead of breathing room air, they're breathing 100% oxygen. And we're measuring then what happens to their tumor. And in this particular tumor, they uh, bre when they bred, when they bre bred, <laughs> when they breathed 100% oxygen, nothing happened. So if you used a treatment that was designed to increase the tumor oxygen, if you didn't measure it, you now use the treatment and you say the treatment's no good because nothing happened. I increased the oxygen, I hadn't breathed 100% oxygen, and nothing happened. But of course, it didn't increase the oxygen because that tumor wasn't in close collaboration with the, uh, with the circulatory system. On the other hand, this one, where it's gone from this before we breathe oxygen, when the line gets broad, it looks smaller. So this one is changed from four millimeters of mercury uh, to 150 millimeters of mercury. This one, if we treated now, would respond to therapy. So that's really, in a very sim oversimplified way, the key so between those two patients, patients, you use the same treatment to increase oxygen. In one case, you'd fail, and in the other case, you'd succeed. But you never know that your technique was working if you couldn't make the measurement. We couldn't make the measurement without this instrument. We couldn't have this instrument without this cancer center and without the support that we get for, for, through the Prouty and, and other methods. And we're now developing some methods to go deeper. Uh, but uh, well, in the interest of time, I'll go past this one. And uh, so just to conclude this part of the talk, and we reserve the best for last, for next, which is, uh, for last, which is Anne. Uh, but to finish up my part then is we're now, for the first time, measuring oxygen within the, within the radiation oncology department, w doing it in real patients under conditions that are compatible with clinical care, and that's part of the name of the game, is you can have exotic, wonderful measurements, but if you can't make them under ordinary clinical conditions, it doesn't do you any good. Uh, we've been able to measure the oxygen in tumors. It's never been able to be done before this way continuously, and we've seen these different responses. Uh, in general, it's as we expected, they were low, and in some patients, just breathing a very simple implementable thing in any clinic to just breathe 100% oxygen, it went up. And now we have a variety of ways of expanding on the technique uh, with the support of the cancer center and their extensive measurements. And now I'm gonna turn this over to uh, uh, my favorite colleague, and I must admit that we are related by marriage. Uh, <laughs> she would not admit it. Yeah. <laughs> We've also often found it helpful to have different last names because then you can sort of uh, say if they're married or not. So <laughs> it's been particularly valuable for her to be able to. That's right. <laughs> so part of what I wanted to talk about again to emphasize uh, that the research that the Prouty and the Cancer Center are really helping us do is what Hal has just gone through. And what we're also doing with basically the same instrumentation, but it's a very different kind of application, 
is uh, what we're now going to be talking about, which is dosimetry. And that, is it not? I, yeah, I don't think I got it. Please, but you're close. Okay. Yes. Well, I have a quiet voice, so. Yeah, speak up. Okay. Okay. So anyway, what we would like to really um, do is also emphasize that the the people from the Prouty, from the board, have helped us so much because we are actually conducting research at the Prouty. I hope some of you have seen the work that we've been doing while we're there. And we have also been trying, with the help of people who are very generous in terms of being measured, actually have raised a few thousand dollars ourselves for the Prouty. So we are both beneficiaries and we hope give back a little bit. This particular person here is a, a new mascot. Her name is Amelia. And one of the, the uh, things that we're about to try to do is to try to gather deciduous teeth because we would like to have teeth that we can begin to also include children in some of our measurements. And so we are about to launch a new study uh, and a new um, respective where we are calling it the Tooth Fairy Project. And Amelia is our Tooth Fairy. Um, also at the Prouty this last time because we want to try to go to the schools to help them uh, figure out how to give us some um, new uh, sources of teeth for that. So, whoops. So that's Amelia. And this is our group at the most recent Prouty. We were, uh, were actually more than, than the people listed here. We were out for a day and a half measuring uh, teeth. Uh, some of you may have participated or clipping nails. So that is part of our tooth and nail uh, version of things. So why were we measuring uh, teeth and uh, clipping nails? Basically it's because EPR can also be used for dosimetry. It uh, can detect changes in enamel, therefore teeth, and in keratin, therefore nails that uh, happen along with radiation exposure. And those changes reflect the total dose, and they are consonant with the dose that you receive, so that we can measure how much dose you have received. You don't need to do that with radiation patients. They know what the dose is. This is a very different kind of setting that we're now talking about, where the dose is unexpected. It's an unknown dose. One of the things that you yourselves are, I'm sure, aware of is in recently talking about Fukushima. Um, fortunately, the people in Fukushima and around the um, disaster that happened along with their uh, nuclear plant had um, higher than they wanted doses but lower than needed uh, extra treatment. So we were, in fact, very closely working with some of the people in Japan about maybe turning some of our machines over to Japan, and we're working with colleagues there. We did not wind up sending our machine there. But this is an example that is kind of new and kind of recently in everybody's brain as to the kinds of things that can happen that are unexpected doses that involve many, many thousands of people who do not know what dose they have received. Um, the other one, which is uh, what we're planning for uh, with the help and uh, involvement of Health and Human Services is more like a terrorist example where they have a nuclear bomb that might have uh, radiation effects, or not nuclear, but any kind of bomb, dirty bomb and otherwise. So we are using the same technique to be able to look at the uh, exposures that people think that they've been uh, exposed to but don't necessarily know. And the reason why that's important is that the treatment that you would get for this depends on the dose that you received. If you do not have a high dose, you do not need treatment, and the treatment that you might get is both expensive and sometimes rather nasty. You do not want this treatment if you don't need it. So it's very important for us to begin to understand why. This is our uh, machine that we are actually used at the Prouty and are about to send it down to Dana-Farber. Uh, it consists uh, on the left of a simple office chair, and uh, you can see the magnet around that. The magnet is, uh, we say it's related to MRI, but that magnet, even though it looks rather large, is about the level of a fairly strong refrigerator magnet. And the uh, resonator that we put against the tooth to measure it is about the strength of a cell phone. So if you're afraid to put your cell phone near your head, 
which most people aren't, um, or a magnet like uh, approaching the refrigerator when you have a magnet on it. That's the level of machine safety that we have here. It's not a very high level of complicated machine, and we are trying very hard to make it feel deployable. And one of the things that's interesting about the Prouty for us is that it's a real experience to try to take it to the field, because we literally had it on the field at the Ray School. We had it in the rain, which was, we're not completely grateful for you for producing one year. We've had it in the wind. We've had it in a lot of settings where we really need to understand what it's like to be in the field, because that's the setting we're likely to have. We want to have untrained operators at the moment. Our operators are our trained EPR spectroscopists, but we are trying to work with GE to turn this into a robotic um, machine that will basically be somebody we can train literally in 10 minutes. That's the thing. So not a year, not six months, not six weeks. We have 10 minutes to pull somebody out of the field and learn how to operate our machines. It needs to be fast. This takes place in about five minutes. Reliable, accurate, safe, and easy. So that's the goal of what we're trying to do. So the different kinds of uh, dosimetry that are available, some of them are environmental monitoring. And in fact, in the big uh, places like New York and so on, there already are these different kinds of uh, monitoring that are really population-based. They're on different bridges and so on. For people who work in the um, nuclear plants, there are badges. There are different kinds of ways. And the Europe tends to go for trying to say, like, could you use your cell phone? Could you use your credit card? Because most of us carry that to begin to look at the dose. So they're trying to look at different plastics. But the US version is that we really want to try to look at uh, how much a person has received. And we're using a biodosimetry approach, which basically says, you might not have your badge on, but how many of you take your teeth to bed with you? or to you know, swim? How many of you take your fingernails with you? Of course, your body then becomes your badge. And so many of these different ways are trying to say, let's use a person themselves as the badge that we can measure in dosimetry. So uh, some of them are clinical symptoms. Some of them are biologics. And in fact, uh, most of the other centers that Hal mentioned around the United States are using biologic measures, are using cheek swabs to look at genetics. But some of the problems with that is that they begin to really react like everything else that's an injury. So there's a fairly limited time window when that injury for genetics or for blood is responding to the uh, radiation, and it's not very specific to radiation. But fortunately, the teeth, the nails, which is what we're doing, are very specific and long-lasting. So some of the things like tooth can last for approximately 50,000 years or more. So it's a little bit beyond your lifetime. Um, so that is an extremely stable thing in contrast to like two or three days for some of the other biologics. So Part of what is extremely unique about Dartmouth is that we are the group that's looking at physical measures for biodosimetry. And other units around the United States are looking at genetics and so on. So just a context. So we are funded by BARDA and by NIAID to do this work. And we have a group or a set of expectations that the uh, Health and Human Services tell us is what we need to prepare for. And one of the things that they say is one of the areas that we would like to be able to plan, prepare, and respond to is the potential in the United States of having a 10 kiloton bomb. Now, that's a fairly big bomb, but if you think about sort of the old Russian stuff, that was more like 40 kiloton. So this is not a big bomb. This is big enough to cause a lot of problems and small enough for terrorists to be actually able to use it. And in that setting you know, that the uh, government is trying to have us look at, it would be likely to be 
put off in an urban setting. And the expectation is that there will be at least a million people all of a sudden, within a few minutes, who are suddenly now needing to be uh, assessed for whether or not they've had radiation exposure. And so this is, again, unknown exposure. And uh, to some extent, if it's below a certain level, too gray, for those of you who are familiar with uh, some of the ways to describe it, you don't need immediate treatment. It's not a good thing. You might need to assess long-term treatment, but you don't need immediate treatment. And yet, like cancer, radiation is a scary thing. And so an awful lot of people, if they think they're exposed to radiation, want to know. And it turns out in radiation accidents, fortunately we don't have many terrorist um, accidents or situations to look at, upwards of 90% of the people who want to be told whether or not they have had significant exposure do not have significant exposure. So most of them you can say, you're okay, worry about something else, but don't worry about this, you don't need treatment. So that's a huge amount that we can work through very quickly if we have the right way to do it. Then there are some other complications I put up here about partial versus whole body exposure and other kinds of accidents. I'm going to skip that. This is the um, sort of schematic that the uh, U.S. government has put forward, and I'm just going to put it up here briefly. So this is what happens if you have a 10 kiloton bomb that lands in Washington, D.C., or New York, or wherever. There's a center point for the bomb, which they call the no-go zone, which is um, sort of a, a nice way of saying, everybody's dead, don't go there. So that's the small part in the very middle. But the rest of it, increasingly where the yellow is, is an area where it's dangerous. Uh, it's light damage, but we're likely to send a lot of first responders in, including our dosimetry measures, because these are people that are trying to escape and leave the area. They should leave the area, um, but they uh, are, uh, you, it's, it's actually okay to go into this area for short periods of time. And then this funny little thing off to the left, or right, I should say, is um, a representation of the fallout. The fallout, of course, changes with wind and weather. One of the things to notice here is that because of this area, um, an awful lot of the hospitals and of the doctor's offices that are in this area, even though they are there, will be not available for this one million people. This is what happened in Fukushima. For the 20 mile or 20 uh, uh, kilometer radius around Fukushima, they basically said, Everybody in the hospitals in that area has to be evacuated. That's not where you go for treatment. You have to arrange for those people to get out of there fast, too. This is likely to happen in this situation so that most, ironically, in the United States, most of the big um, hospitals and big centers and big urban areas put all of their hospitals within blocks of each other. Like within Chicago, there's uh, like a three-block area of the major centers that are all together. Same with Washington, Baltimore, and so on. So we're likely to wipe out our major medical centers in this process uh, and or put them in the plume. So what's left to go to in these little blue boxes are the community centers. So the major thing that we need to do is to basically say, like, now we need to keep people out of the healthcare system. We need to determine, and we're, our center, our, our dosimetry uh, system is set up to go into tents, to go into school basements, to uh, churches, wherever, to set up and immediately try to figure out what is the dosimetry and what is the measurement of people. So we are going to be part of this system and try to again, um, figure out people that we can bring off the streets and help us. So 
the, the euphemism that the U.S. government says is that the infrastructure will be severely compromised. Uh, and that's really true. I've just talked a little bit about the healthcare system being extremely compromised. Most of those facilities will be either destroyed or unusable because they're in the area that is bad. Um, medical records are likely to be lost. We saw this in Katrina where most of the people um, had systems that were completely unuseful for figuring out what records they have. And the doctor's hospital uh, offices are basically unaware of what is likely to be the next things to do. So if you go there and you ask your doctor how to do dosimetry for you, the doctor will say, I have no idea because it is not really widely well known. So the other things, just to put them up here, are other forms of the infrastructure are likely to be completely out of commission. Transportation, information, um, even such things as power or food or gas. This is part of what happened when they sheltered in place in Fukushima. Who wanted to go and bring them new food? If you're supposed to be there and shelter in place, why would you want to trap traips into that area and so on. So we also have to figure out a way that our machine can work with the expectation that there's no um, easily information flow, there's no transportation in and out, and there may be no power. We have to have our own generators. We actually operated off of generators at the uh, Prouty as well. So basically, this is again a public health kind of thing which people are doing. It's not really for basic patient care. And as public health, what uh, the government wants to do is basically, basically say, this should be available, if at all possible, for everyone. Whether or not you're pregnant, whether or not you're disabled, whether or not you're a kid, whether or not you're old, it's really designed for everybody. And it's part of the reason that we go for both teeth and nails because not everybody actually has teeth. And I don't know about you, I, I've now begun to look at everybody's nails, but not everybody has nails you could clip either. So we are also developing another version where we are able to use uh, fingernails without needing to be clipped at putting them into our machine. So that we can begin with the, uh, set, uh, the, the three different ways uh, actually uh, figure out how to do that. So the next statement is about, it looks a very statistical and kind of young, who cares, trying to minimize false negatives. But that's actually a very, very important policy, not a statistical statement. What they're really saying is that we don't want, as a government, to make the mistake of saying, you are okay, go away, don't worry about it. If you're not okay, we do not want any false positives. So that means that our machine needs to be able to make sure that we never tell somebody you are okay if you're not. That's likely to mean that we send a lot more people through who are okay but need another measurement the next layer along. So this is a statistical statement, but it's a very big challenge and a policy challenge as well. The other thing is to use scarce resources wisely. Um, one of the things that happened in the GAO is that they were looking, partly because of the politics of um, uh, people for um, uh, when the, the most recent Democratic and uh, Republican conventions were held. They went to both those uh, different places and some of the major towns. And they tried to say, if you did nothing else, how many beds would be available if you have a million people today who need to go in to the hospital to be measured. And on average, they found about 35 beds in the major hospitals that were available if you did nothing else. And I don't mean 35 beds per hospital. I mean 35 beds per city. So we are really not well prepared for such surge conditions. We need to use things like this. So there are lots of different places where we're trying to do that. But just to summarize, what we're trying to do in this setting, it's a very different kind of way of thinking. We're actually trying to keep people out of the healthcare system. We're coming in long before you go to a doctor's office or a hospital 
and we're saying, look, you're okay, worry about something else, but you're okay, leave the area, do something else, but you don't need to go and be measured, or don't need to go to the doctor's hospital. So it's a very different kind of way of thinking than we've done in the past. And the major thing we're trying to do is to triage those people who do need treatment so that they can get that immediate treatment for acute radiation. There are long-term consequences, but they don't need to be dealt with immediately. It won't make any difference. Uh, we need to pay some attention to it, but not first thing. And so our particular version is what is called the first level of triage, where we will go into that yellow area and try to help as many people as fast as we can to figure out that they don't need to go into the healthcare system. They need to get out of that area instead. And those few people that we need to see, those few people are 300,000. So it's not still a small number, but we've at least eliminated 700,000. So that's what we're doing with this particular thing. And with that, I will sort of end. Yeah. So, Anne, uh, Hal, thanks a lot. Um, uh, I think it's really quite remarkable that you can take one piece of instrumentation and have such um, diverse and novel, uh, really innovative uh, approaches to using it. Um, um, how does it, one envision that at some point these things will actually be small enough to be portable, that they'll be part of an early response piece? So they are, they're, they're actually portable. So the whole thing weighs uh, about 80 pounds. And so... Uh, two <laughs> That's not portable, but I'm carrying it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm each, each piece will be less than 50 pounds, so it actually yeah. can be carried by two people. Mm -hmm. and, and, that, and when you look at the overall response plans, there's lots of equipment that they want to bring in that weighs a lot more than that. Uh -huh. I think... Um, you know, the exciting piece for me in terms of having it small and portable is that I imagine using it to examine every patient's tumor during every aspect of therapy as a way to understand better what the sensitivities of their tumors are to, to oxygenation. And we have versions now that we're talking about going into the operating room yeah. to, uh, to help. Okay, good. Well, I know uh, Hal and Ann will be here afterwards um, to answer any questions, uh, as will I. Um, uh, Jean, some housekeeping, and just a word of thanks uh, once again. And thank you. That was wonderful. I mean, it, who knew at the Prouty that that's what we were helping and, and making such a difference for your research? We're really honored. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Um, the reception continues now on the sixth floor. We are on the fourth floor. And